we see a few people still trickling in, but since many of you are already here, uh, we will go ahead and get started. Uh, hello, my name is Bobby Mann. I'm the Maddie's Human Animal Support Services Pilot Director here with an amazing star-studded cast of people from the philanthropy and fundraising world. They're gonna be talking about uh, how to finish 2020 strong and to prepare for 2021. So to get it kicked off, I'd love to go around our panel and just say hello. So I'll start with Bailey. Hi everybody, my name is Bailey Deacon. I'm the Director of Community Engagement at Barks, which is the Baltimore Animal Rescue and Care Shelter. And that's just a fancy title for communications, media, and events. All fall under me here. Great, Sarah? Hi everybody, uh, I'm Sarah Wan. I work for Friends of Pima Animal Care Center. Uh, we are the nonprofit partner to our municipal shelter here in Tucson. Ashley T. Hi, my name is Ashley Temple. I am the program director for Indie Cares, a shelter diversion program that serves our city's shelter, uh, Indianapolis Animal Care Services. Ashley D. Hi everyone, Ashley Drozier, development director with the Animal Welfare League of Alexandria, located just outside of Washington, DC. And Brian. Hey everyone, I'm Brian Darty. I am the chief philanthropy and communications officer for San Diego Humane Society. And I guess that's just a long way of saying I do the same things that Bailey does pretty much, <laughs> but I have better weather than Bailey has by a long shot. So. I'll give you that, it's true. Right. Strong work. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, and to kick off this presentation, I'm gonna just give a very high level overview on what the Haas Project and Movement are. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, so as you can see by this pretty amazing map, um, just to tell you a little bit about the Human Animal Support Services project, uh, Haas is a project slash movement that's powered by these 38 pilot shelters, which you see as these dots on this map, and over 620 industry experts that have come together in over 38 working groups to really try to reimagine the future of sheltering. This is really just a very high level overview on some of the components of Haas. As you can see, the center, the real big focus and core of Haas is really to understand um, not only using research and data, innovation, uh, get, by getting government support and buy-in for the work that we're doing, having a diversity, equity, inclusion lens. And then all of that is really wrapped in the foundational elements that make up Haas. So those are actually 16 foundational elements that go from things like lost and found without a kennel, shelters, what does the future of fostering look like, COVID response, field services and public safety. And as you can see in the bigger bubble, that is all wrapped around by our community. So it's really about how do we implement community-based services to be able to not only meet people where they are, but provide the resources that people need in order to keep pets safe and in the homes where they belong. So we can go to the next slide. This is just a quick overview of our tier one and tier two shelters. Uh, many people ask the difference between a tier one or a tier two. So our pilot organizations are really all in on the Haas project, uh, not in only just our values, but also all of the elements they are hoping to implement within the next year of the pilot program. Uh, so these are our tier one shelters and Sarah, we can go to the next one for our tier two shelters. So together, these shelters have been working incredibly hard uh, with not only innovation, but helping develop toolkits for best practices for a lot of these elements that we're talking about, which we're very excited to be rolling out for all of you in 2021. Can go next slide. And so without further ado, I'm going to toss it over to Brian to talk about the culture of philanthropy. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Bobby. Um, so the title of this presentation was Finishing Strong in 2020 and Preparing for 2021. And I'm imagining that people who have joined us on this call have joined because you're thinking, you know what, what's one of the things that we need to do? We need to raise more money. And Bobby just outlined the fundamental elements of the Haas program. And in taking a look at that, if you're like any of the tier one shelters, tier two shelters, or probably any shelter in this country, you would likely think to yourself, we need more funding to do all of these elements and to do them at the level that we want to do them and that our communities need. I think there's probably not too much debate about that. So much of today's presentation is going to be wrapped around specific types of fundraising you can do and probably the types of things that people think about when you think about fundraising, about email campaigns, about direct mail, about some of the other things that actually bring the money in. What I'm going to do is sort of start us off with a foundation about a culture of philanthropy. Because no matter where any organization is in this process, whether you're an organization that has already a sophisticated fundraising machine that's working for you, or you're one that's just starting out, 
developing and building a culture of philanthropy is an essential element in this. So my pitch to everyone on this call is no matter where you are, to put this as an element, not just to think about what are we gonna do new with our direct mail program next year? How are we gonna do fundraising on social media? To think about what are we going to do to actively and strategically develop a culture of philanthropy at our organization, starting right now to really pay dividends in 2021 and far beyond. So taking a look at what that culture is, because I'm gonna guess that for many of the folks on this call, this isn't something that your organizations have ever talked about. So in taking a look, it's a subset of your culture. This is what it looks like in kind of defining it, but it really goes far beyond what this slide is. What you're really looking for, again, is to make sure that every single person in your organization understands that philanthropy and not just fundraising, I want to urge folks to, to use philanthropy as a term instead of fundraising or development or any of those other terms. What we're talking about is engaging our community philanthropically to support our mission, to get behind our work, and to save lives. And for everyone in the organization to understand that it's not just the philanthropy team's job to do that. It is every single person's job to be able to promote philanthropy, to be able to articulate a case for support, to view the fundraising and the philanthropy mechanism as a mission aligned program of the organization. And that's really why that's bolded on this slide. That's essentially what this comes down to is oftentimes the philanthropy team will be kind of relegated. They sit in a silo, they do their work kind of in a vacuum, money comes in, it funds programs, and that's that. Getting entire buy-in from the organization to understand that this is actually a program that is aligned with the mission. It is not just aligned with it. It's fundamental to the success of every organization here, our ability to increase our philanthropic support. So how do we develop the systems to actually do that? So if we want to go to the next slide. Um, one of the things that I, I, I've spent a lot of time working on at Sandy Humane Society is ensuring that when we talk about cultural philanthropy, people understand we're not even really talking about fundraising. What we're talking about is making the world better for animals. That's why this is important, because I know that there are people on this call who, when you think you hear that word fundraising or you hear the word philanthropy, you think, I don't want to talk about that. And um, I just want to remind people, philanthropy is not just another F word. It is something that you want to say. You want to be able to use this word around your organization in a very, very positive way to save more animals. So if we want to go to the next slide, this is in fact about more than money. It's about three things and really getting everyone to understand that, that truly everyone in the organization is a part of educating your community about the work that you do, but not just educating them, inspiring them about what it, what it means to make the world better for animals, and then providing ways to engage them. And engagement isn't just about philanthropic support. Engagement is about volunteerism. Engagement is about social media advocacy. Engagement is about um, just spreading the word in your community. It's about adopting animals. So there are so many ways that if we do those first two points, if we educate and we inspire our community, they will be far more engaged in our work. And when we look at this, there's no doubt in my mind that every single shelter on this call likely says the same thing. The people in our community are not fully aware of the impact that we make for animals. Our programs and services aren't fully understood. And as a result of having that lack in, or that gap in knowledge in your community about the work that you provide versus what people think you're providing, you are missing resources because the level of funding you have right now is based on a number of things. And one of those things that it's based on is what people think you are and what people think you do. So your ability to educate, inspire, and engage your folks by having every single person on your team involved in that communications effort, in that philanthropy effort, is absolutely essential in bridging that gap and raising more money. So if we wanna to go to the next slide, what a, a couple of things that we've done, and this is meant to be a very, very quick overview of this. Uh, in terms of creating this culture at San Diego Humane Society. We have actually included that building our culture of philanthropy is in every single job description that we have here. So that every person who comes on board understands the essential role that philanthropy pay, plays in our execution of our mission and in making San Diego and the world better for animals. We include in our new hire orientation, a talk on philanthropy that outlines the individual role that those new members will play in helping to create the culture of philanthropy, what it means and why it matters. We've implemented a campus fundraising initiative, which is admittedly a terrible, 
terrible name for this program, but we couldn't think of anything better. We have multiple campuses at San Diego Humane Society. And what this is, is a program where every adoption that's made, we ask for a donation to San Diego Humane Society. And four years ago, when we started this program, we received exactly zero dollars in that. Now we're at over $200,000 a year that comes in. This is money that is all being generated and raised because of our adoptions counselors and because of our team that are, are checking our adopters out at the time of their adoption, are talking to them about philanthropy. We train them to not just work with them about what that animal adoption is about, but also about what philanthropy means and how they can be a part of our organization post adoption. And I think that is an absolutely critical step. So whether you're adopting out a couple hundred animals a year, a couple thousand or tens of thousands of animals, your adopters, and I realize there are a number of organizations out there that say adopters don't donate. This is only one small portion of this, but we're generating over $200,000 a year right now in that program alone. And it integrates philanthropy throughout our entire organization. We also work that anytime new directors are hired, um, me and other members of my team will meet with those directors to talk to them about how their budget works, what philanthropy does and what philanthropy does not do, and how they can help us in basically sharing their stories. Because essentially that's what we are. We're the storytellers on the philanthropy side of the equation to take out the messaging to our community about what we do. But we need an active partnership and exchange of information. We need the other elements of our program from animal care staff to veterinary staff. Um, you pick what portion of this is. Our humane law enforcement officers are consistently feeding us with stories that we can promote. And it used to be that those stories just kind of sat and didn't get executed. Now we can put those stories out, they raise money for us and we have active partnerships throughout this organization uh, with basically every single arm that impacts animals directly. Um, and then those other two points I'm gonna sort of hold on because I know we're trying to get through this quickly and Bobby did a great job of sticking to his two minutes. I'm gonna try and do a job of sticking to my 10 minutes and I think that I've essentially done that. I will note this, our contact information is in there. If there's anyone on this call who wants more information on what we've done at San Diego Humane Society on building a culture of philanthropy, just reach out to me directly. Uh, I'm happy to chat about that in further detail. And with that, I will pass it on to hear a little bit more about branding and strategy. Thanks, Brian. Thanks everybody for being here today. Um, we really appreciate it and I hope you get some good takeaways. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about branding and strategy and just to remind everybody, um, I'm Sarah Wolf Vaughn. I work for Friends of Pima Animal Care Center. So we're actually not the shelter, we're the nonprofit partner to the shelter. Um, so we basically exist just to fundraise. Um, so that's what I do all day. So I'm here to talk to you about it. Um, branding um, is really the how, like how you go about presenting this culture of philanthropy that Brian was talking about, how you present it to the world. Um, the culture of philanthropy is really the foundational success um, to your organization and your fundraising, which ultimately leads to program success. So what is branding? Um, it's really the look, the feel, and the sound of your organization. Uh, and and the values that inspire all of those things. So you really wanna be clear about what your values are before you go into the branding um, aspect of things. So yeah, your logo, color scheme, what fonts you use, um, that sort of thing. It's also, people are gonna judge you. They're gonna make assumptions about your organization um, no matter what, but having a strong brand will help control or guide, I'll say guide, um, that conversation. So why is it important? Well, it distinguishes your organization. Um, if your community is, is lucky enough to be like ours, we certainly have tons of rescues and different shelters um, and groups working to help all the animals and families in our communities that need us. And um, when there's so many players, right, we wanna make sure that we can distinguish our organization. So having a strong brand, um, it clarifies the issues that your particular organization is working on um, and what value you bring to the community. Next slide, please. So we're almost at the end of the year. I can't believe it. Um, so right here, we have some long-term projects um, and some short-term projects. So long-term, you're gonna wanna think about a visual brand guide. Uh, this visual brand guide is going to be, um, ours is a PDF, for example. Um, 
and it shows like our logos, our different logos, the sizing, the color, the fonts, um, all those different things. Uh, our messaging guidelines are basically how we talk about our mission. What is our mission? How do we talk about it? How do we want others to talk about it? And um, like words we use, for example, instead of um, animal control, we wanna use animal care or animal control officer, animal protection officer, and just important terms like that, that really define the culture, right? And, um, and show the world what culture your organization has. Uh, the case for support, Brian also mentioned this, it's a great um, essential piece to philanthropy. Uh, what is your story? What is your mission? Why should people get involved and how can they get involved? Um, and then, of course, you'll want to take a step back and see who's who's your audience, who um, who is already, you know, being reached by your organization, maybe who who is being left out of that reach, um, and what you can do to get there. Um, so, short-term projects to keep in mind, since we are closing in on the end of the year, um, logo acquisition. It's super worth in investing in a local designer who can create a logo for you. Um, you can see a great example of branding on this PowerPoint, right? The Human Animal Support Services logo there in the corner. Um, that way people know who you are, right? It, people can associate a certain look and feel and they know it's you as soon as they see something. Um, so that's really important. The second one is getting to work on the messaging guidelines. So this, this is really important because it's how, um, how you and people in your organization talk about the work you're doing. And we have created a messaging guidelines worksheet that um, we're gonna post, I think Bobby just posted in the chat. So check that out. Um, I really recommend uh, taking that to multiple people in your organization, not just your communications folks, um, and getting, getting their opinion as you're working on that messaging, those messaging guidelines. All right, so strategy, what is it? Well, it's a thoughtful and data-driven plan of action by definition, right? Um, but what it is, is it's uh, a framework that we can build uh, that helps us be proactive instead of reactive. Um, especially in animal welfare, I think it's really easy to, to be reactive because a lot of us you know, who work in a shelter environment, we have emergencies every day, all day, right? We're saved, we're on the front lines saving lives. Um, and so this really, having a strategy gives us a second to step back and gives us a framework to really make informed data-driven decisions. Um, it's basically your roadmap, how you're going to get from point A to point B. Um, and as you can see in this Cheshire Cat uh, and Alice in Wonderland graphic over here, uh, it's one of my favorites. So Alice says, what road do I take? And the cat says, well, where are you going? And Alice doesn't know. And so then the cat says it doesn't matter, right? So if you don't know where you're going or where you want to be or need to be, um, then who knows where you'll end up, right? Nowhere or anywhere. Um, and that's certainly not where we want to be. Um, next slide, please. So for strategy, um, you're going to want to do uh, just a review of everything, um, your internal and external data, whatever you have. I know many of you may not even have that data build up, built up yet. Um, so that is a long-term strategy. Um, you know, look, look at your mission, your objectives, your values, your vision, um, and how you want to lay out how the best way is to lay out to get there. Um, and of course, after you make decisions and act on these uh, strategic uh, plans, you want to evaluate um, the evaluate and control the results of the performance um, so that you make sure you can adjust as you need to. Uh, Short-term strategy. Um, many of you may have done a SWOT analysis, but if not, I definitely recommend doing it. Um, and it's really as simple as this graphic on here. Um, make a chart, and again, this is something I recommend doing with everyone in your organization, <laughs> like give it to everybody to work on, work in teams, um, and really talk about brainstorm. What are your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and your threats? Um, this can really bring up a lot of insightful information. Uh, my organization did this SWOT analysis and um, talked about our why, which is the next step, uh, at a board retreat, and it was like really revelatory for us because we we have such a good relationship with the shelter that, um, and we're there Monday through Friday usually, um, that we can oftentimes get caught up in the day-to-day, -day, right, in the reactive stuff. But really the only reason our organization exists is to get enough money to make sure that the shelter can be proactive, right? And the shelter can meet the needs, uh, the immediate needs. 
So that was actually like a really big revelation to the board and to our small staff um, as to like why we exist and what we need to do to stay focused on our why um, and to do what's best for the animals. Um, so yeah, and without further ado, I will pass it on to Ashley. Thank you. So my name again is Ashley Temple. I am the program director for Indy Cares. Indy Cares is a shelter diversion program that serves Indianapolis Animal Care Services. Um, and I'm gonna be talking a little bit about social media fundraising. Um, to start, I really wanted to just um, show a little bit of information that really I think identifies the power that social media has, especially when it does come to fundraising for organizations and nonprofits. Um, Obviously, social media has transformed the world of online fundraise, uh, fundraising, and it's to this point, I think, uh, an element for organizations um, to connect and engage with their donors that they really can't get in a whole lot of other avenues. Um, and while there are multiple different uh, social media hubs, you know, Instagram, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, any of those, uh, Facebook is still and has been for a very long time the heavyweight when it comes to social media use. 63% uh, of people are accessing the app in any given month and an average of five times a day. Um, and I really liked that um, Forrester Data Digest also pulled in comparison, Instagram is only reaching 27% a month with Twitter bringing up the rear at 22%. So while there's something certainly to be said for using all of these, um, Facebook is one of those that it's just, it's becoming irreplaceable as far as social media um, following and connection with people that you hope to become donors with your organization. Um, and I think by utilizing Facebook, social media in general, um, appropriately, organizations can really create shareable content that provides true dependable donor income. Um, so then the next slide, please. So I just wanted to break down um, some strategies that really truly work. Um, and I think they're easy things that you can start doing today um, that will hopefully make an impact on the follower and engagement that you see with your social media presence. Um, so number one, just determining what produces engagement. Um, Facebook thankfully is really great about um, giving you access to track your posts and shows you what um, what your followers like to see, what they're clicking on, what they're commenting on, what they're sharing with their friends. And it means a lot to track what posts are gaining the most traction because then you can tailor your future pro posts accordingly. You can um, create posts that you know your followers want to see. Um, number two is just defining your needs. Um, I think one of the most important things for organizations that sometimes gets overlooked is just telling people, telling your followers, telling your donors what you need. Provide a fundraising goal, share with your followers what their donation is buying, share how it helps your organization, share how it helps the animals that are in your care, and just telling them what exactly their don donation, what exactly their money is going to be buying for you and your organization. Um, number three, showcase your organization. I mean, obviously, we all um, spend a lot of time on social media asking for things, fundraising, etc. But I think it's really important to make sure that you remember that the goal, um, ideally, is to constantly be getting new followers. And you want to make sure that you are also making them feel included and um, keeping them in the loop as far as what your organization does. So tell your story, describe what your impact is, describe what you want your impact to be if it isn't already, and make sure that you are being very, very transparent about um, your needs and what your achievements are. Not only your needs, but telling people, telling your followers, telling your donors what you've been able to do because of their contribution. Um, number four, consistency. Stay on your followers' radar, um, posting habitually. I think this um, can sometimes be one of those things where it's a gray area. You never know how much um, people want to see or how little they want to see. You know, no one wants to have um, one organization on their Facebook that just seems to constantly be posting new content to the point where they can't even keep up with following it or donating or engaging with any of the posts. But you want to make sure that you are at least becoming a habitual and regular presence on your followers feed. So make sure that you're consistent about your posts you're making sure that you stay present and engaging with your followers by being habitual. 
Um, and number five, participate in donor movements. Um, branded graphics, especially I know coming up at the end of November is going to be Giving Tuesday. These branded graphics and the hashtags that go along with them gain a lot of followers. And it's because it's a worldwide um, hashtag phenomena that people can follow. And by following those hashtags, it brings them back to your site. So when you're participating in those, you're already getting graphics that you don't have to make. You're getting hashtags that you don't have to create. It's very little effort on your part, which gets you engagement with people that may have not been seeing your um, content before. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just real quick stuff that you can start doing right now. Um, the next post that you make, the next uh, picture you decide to post. These are things that you can start doing right now that I think will make a difference in the engagement that you're seeing with your followers. Um, number one, creating a schedule. Um, posting content for every organization, there are times of days or days of the week that are going to be most effective for you. Um, there are certain guidelines that um, many people have done studies on, you know, posting at night versus posting early in the morning, etc but you really need to figure out what works best for your followers. And again, Facebook provides a lot of ways for you to kind of keep, keep track of this. Um, and it's important to create a schedule, but then stick to it. You're able to schedule posts. So you don't have to be available at 8 p.m. on a Tuesday to create a post. You just need to make sure that you're creating that comment, content, being habitual about when you post and making sure that you're posting content when you know people will engage. Um, the second thing, high quality photos. Um, I know that when I'm scrolling, I will scroll right on past something that's blurry or it doesn't catch my eye. And it's something that you can easily do as far as, you know, most people have smartphones now, smartphones have great cameras, just making sure that you're posting photos that uh, are visually engaging. They look good, they catch your eye. It's going to make it more difficult for someone to just scroll by it. Um, next thing is breaking up large paragraphs. Again, it doesn't matter how often you post if people are just continuously scrolling by your content. A way to mitigate that a little bit is by breaking up your large paragraphs or your stories with appropriate spacing, but then the use of emojis. Um, it's a silly thing that does catch people's eye and it makes people pause over your content and then more likely to engage with, with it once they have. Um, using hashtags, like I discussed in the previous slide, Things like Wishlist Wednesday, Success Story Sunday, these are the kinds of things that create um, habits with your followers so they know what to expect with your social media presence. And if they know what to expect, they become more of an engaged follower and then act when you ask them to, whether that be donating, signing up to foster, signing up to volunteer, they will act with your posts when you request them to do so. Um, and then again, this kind of ties in with the, with the uh, top most tip is knowing what day and times to post based on your follower engagement. And I can't say this enough. Every, every organization is different. You're going to find that some people um, engage more in the evening, some people engage more in the morning, but find out what works for your organization and stick to it. D this doesn't mean that you can't post at any other time of day or any other day of the week, but it means that you know when you need to target your audience. If you're asking for fundraising, make sure you post it at a time of day or a day of the week that is going to engage with your followers. And then last but not least, um, engaging on your part. Respond to comments, say thank you. If someone says, just donated with the exclamation point, follow up and say, thank you so much. We, we really appreciate it. Or you know, post updates for stories on pets that people really seem to get um, attached to, you know, people want to feel like they are making a difference with your organization. And a really easy way to do that is just by responding. Um, next slide, please. So email fundraising is um, something that is constantly being used and it's only increasing. Um, again, a little bit of data just to follow up with what we were saying, 3.9 billion daily email users. And by 2023, um, this is expected to increase to 4.3 billion. That means that if you are not using email fundraising, you absolutely need to figure out a way to make it happen for you and your organization. Um, email message accounting accounted for 16% of all online revenue in 2019. And 
the difference between emailing versus social media is, is it allows your organization to fine tune your content specifically for the audience that requests to be involved. So the idea is that people are requesting to have emails sent to them, which means you can target your message specifically for the people that wanted more information. So again, just some effective email strategies that you can kind of follow up with. Building your email list. This sounds really easy, but you really also need to focus on who you're targeting. Make sure you're collecting emails from everyone that donates. Events, if they decide that they wanna to come to an event, which I realize with COVID-19 events are obviously more virtual right now, but you can still target these people if they are deciding to be present at an event. That means they like your organization, they wanna be more involved, get their email and follow up with them. Number two, tailoring content. So what I was saying before is these are the kind of people that if they have chosen to give you an email address, that means they want more information. So you can find what stories are resonating with your followers and build on that for more information through email marketing promoting exciting advancements, what you wanna do in the future, give big updates on um, pets or animals in your shelter that people really seem to uh, you know, connect with and making sure that you're giving the content that subscribers want to read. Number three, be concise. As powerful as email fundraising it is, um, most people get a whole lot of emails a day. So you wanna make sure that when they click to open the email from your organization, you are getting their attention, keeping their attention, but then making sure that you are not wearing them out by the information you're providing. Keeping it short, sweet, to the point. If you are including a call to action to donate, volunteer, um, you know, sign up for events, any of those sorts of things, you need to make sure you keep it at the top and you keep your paragraphs short and engaging. That's all I have. Um, so I will now pass it on to the direct mail portion of the presentation. From one Ashley to another, thanks so much for sharing, Ashley. That was really great. I really appreciated and enjoyed the opportunity to learn more. So while Ashley with a Y shared a little bit more about email fundraising and social, which is uh, you know the exciting uh, digital world, I'm here to tell you not to forget about direct mail. In fact, direct mail is far from dead. It is a huge asset to organizations. And I want to talk to you a little bit about it and a little bit about some ideas you can do right now to help increase your 2020 bottom line. So according to INC, direct mail is a type of advertising messages are sent to targeted customers through the mail. So really for this conversation, we're talking about the tangible hard copies that you get through the U.S. Postal Service. A direct mail piece really is an opportunity for you to give a tangible touch to your current and potential donors. You should be sharing a story about your organization, something that you've done to really help a specific animal. And then whatever you do, make sure that it has a strong call to action, which is really to donate. Asking people to donate to advance your mission to help future animals like the one that you're describing in your study. So why is direct mail uh, really important? Well, according to a 2009 study by Bangor University, the paper appeals, this is your, your paper, hard copy paper, that those appeals uh, produce greater emotions and responses. And a 2015 study said that it produces um, cognitive effects that suggest it's easier to understand and more memorable. So the story that you're telling should you know really resonate with your uh, readers and really connect them to the mission and to the work that you're doing right now. Slide. Great, so if direct mail is not dead <laughs> and it should be incorporated into your philanthropic strategy to relay back to my colleagues, Brian and Sarah, who talked earlier about strategy and philanthropy, in the long term, think about how you can incorporate it to your strategy. How can you make direct mail one of those tactics that are really important to what you do? You could start in-house and do some quarterly mailings. So that would mean every quarter, think about reaching out to your donors and sharing a really key story about you helping a specific animal. And then as well, how their support can have you help more animals who are in a similar specific situation. 
If you're a larger organization, you might want to go with an agency and be able to do monthly mailings. I can say that we use an agency uh, in Alexandria, incredibly successful and uh, brings in a large portion of our funding. What I wanted to make sure as well is that not only should you be looking at your current donors, you should also be thinking about acquiring new donors. And you know, we know that acquiring donors takes more money, more time, more effort, but you really need to have that acquisition pipeline moving forward because that's gonna help you in the long run make sure that those donors that are dropping off that you have a new pipeline of donors to come in and be part of it. So a couple of different things to be thinking about inquiring new donors. You can buy or rent lists, uh, include internal groups. So think about groups that might not already be adopted, um, be donors to you. Uh, think about adopters doing an adoptiversary. Think about your volunteers asking them to support you in a different way. You can also share lists with other organizations. I worked for a large uh, health organization in my prior life, and it was a great place. Um, they would share lists with other large health organizations so that you could really kind of help find people who are interested in both causes. What I will make sure though, is that before you think about sharing any lists that you take a hard look at your privacy policy, make sure that you're not um, violating anybody's requests. I'll also say that everything that Ashley Temple just talked about in terms of digital outreach should mirror your direct mail. And it doesn't have to be an exact. These are not identical, you know, identical siblings. But think about first cousins. So what you're talking about in the voice and the language and your branding from your digital aspect should also be kind of seen within the direct mail piece. Maybe digital is a way to really be sharing more of that story or that visual storytelling through video and imagery, while your direct mail could then be telling it via words and telling that longer story that then has a really hard, crisp call to action. So those are all great ideas, I know, and but we have six weeks to the end of the year. What are we gonna do to make sure that we finish 2020 strong? Well, I really want you to think about getting something in the mail before the year ends. In fact, getting something in the mail before the end of the month would be a huge asset. So think about going back to your LIBUTs and your SIBUTs. So last year, but not this year. So everybody who donated to you in 2019, who has not yet donated in 2020, but also your SIBUTs some year, but not this year. So go back to 2018 and 2017. Cross-check them against everybody who's donated in 2020 and then send out an appeal. Maybe send out a letter talking about how amazing your organization has been about helping animals in need through the COVID pandemic. Or maybe include, write a holiday card. Holiday cards are a great way to reconnect with your donors, wishing them well this holiday and reminding them while <laughs> their pets may be interested in an extra treat on Thanksgiving or on their holiday, you know, that pets in your community might not have enough food to fill their bellies and you really need help. Or consider doing a crowd raising appeal, which is a great thing to tag on to your digital assets. A crowd raising appeal to fund a specific program or project or pet. This is a great way to get in front of your donors to make it very tactical, very tangible. They can see the direct impact of where they go. But no matter what, as you walk away, remember direct mail is not dead. The post office is still your friend and you definitely want to send a direct mail piece before the year is over. So now I'm gonna pass it forward to my colleague to talk about virtual events. Thanks, Ashley. And I just wanna be a little witness to that. Um, Barks decided to resurrect our direct mail program this year, which seemed like a crazy idea, but we made our entire goal with just one mailing. So if you have not done direct mail yet, um, if you, you know, are new to the space or whether you, you know, stopped doing it for 2020, I encourage you to follow Ashley's advice and bring it back. Um, so thank you for that, Ashley. Um, I am here to talk about virtual events. Um, for many of us, events are a big line item on our budget. Um, we know that animal welfare is a nonprofit space that allows for a lot of popular and adorable events, from festivals to bar crawls, runway shows, and other silly, delightful things. 
Um, we love to have fun to raise money for animals. But in many cases, these events are large community gatherings filled with a lot of people, a lot of animals, petting of animals, people being in close quarters. And so for most of our events this year, they got canceled out of safety for our community and safety for our staff and our volunteers. Um, and if you're like Barks, you had to put a lot of zeros, a lot of best guesses and a lot of maybes on your budget lines for events this year. Um, I personally have never put so many question marks on a budget draft until 2020. However, with all that said, this part of the presentation is actually here to make a case as to why events are still really important in 2020 and how we shouldn't just do an overarching cut them and move on, but instead pivot to virtual solutions. Um, because aside from immediate ticket revenue, events uh, bring tremendous value to your organization, which ultimately leads to financial support and other fundraising programs and initiatives. Um, events bring a sense of community and audience engagement. So they allow supporters to interact with your organization in a positive way. Animal advocates of all kinds are able to get together and celebrate the animal community and feel good about raising money to help animals for your in your shelter. Um, events provide a good balance of happiness in an industry that can often feel heavy and endless. And in 2020, more than ever, allowing your supporters to associate your organization with a smile is so important. Plus, with most people's calendars being wide open, they are looking for ways to do good and make a difference. Another important thing about events, aside from the revenue, is that they are acquisition of new supporters. So when a supporter asks their friend to join them in attending your event, or when a fundraiser gets their aunt or uncle to give to their peer-to-peer -peer fundraising page, or when your event gets a bunch of people tagging their friends in it on Facebook, these are all valuable ways that you welcome new people into your organization's family um, without having to purchase any sort of mailing list. For example, this spring uh, at Barks, we played virtual trivia. I asked my friend Kent to sign up for my trivia team. And in doing so, he was entered into our database and started receiving our emails. Now, Kent is a huge dog lover. He is always interested in what's going on at Barks, but we never really had his email in our database. Um, so he would really only participate when I'd ask him to, you know, do something with me. But not having his email meant that that's where it ended. But since he signed up for our virtual trivia, um, it was not long after that that uh, I started noticing that Kent was donating to every single email appeal that we sent out about an animal in need and always talking um, about the animal communications he saw, especially in group settings, telling everybody, uh, you know, did you see that dog at Barks and, and, and encouraging everybody else to donate too. So Kent went from being an event attendee on a you know, friend invite to being a regular cash supporter. And we all know that a new supporter has the most potential to be a continuing supporter if you continue to engage them. So the next thing here is virtual. Oh, that word virtual. <laughs> I don't know um, that any of us could have guessed how many times in 2020 we would say the word virtual. Um, but it, it, it always brings about one of two things, right? So you either hear the word virtual and learn that you have to pivot to doing something virtually and you either you don't bat an eyelash or you wanna sink under your desk and hide. Um, and if you're the type of organization that has always done your event experiences um, to be tangible, to be in-person events and your supporters are also accustomed to that, it can be challenging to reimagine your entire plan to be centered around the internet. Um, but there are solutions out there. There are tools that can turn a traditional gala virtual, they can turn a 5K virtual, and tools to allow you to try brand new events that you've never done before. Um, so here's a little mixed list of ways to get started. Um, our first thing is using free resources. So Facebook, social media, Google Forms, Twitch, Zoom, um, free, free, free. It is easy to Google software for online auction and come up with a $5,000 solution. But that isn't in everybody's budget and especially in animal welfare. Um, but did you know 
that you could run a successful online auction via Facebook. We're doing it at Barks and we've actually had other rescues in our community do it too. Um, you can think about online platforms that you already use as your tools for these virtual events. And then our next thing here is help from tech savvy volunteers. Who in your organization can help? You do not have to be the tech savvy person that gets it together. At Barks, we have learned this year to rely on our volunteers, especially those younger volunteers. They have all kinds of tools and tricks and ideas that can help you get your event off of the ground. Um, another thing that we've learned at Barks is being prepared with FAQs to help your supporters. So a lot of us for events, we, we have our regular FAQs. Well, how, where's parking? Um, what should I be wearing? Uh, you've got to think of that in the same situation, but with virtual. Um, give people extra time and do test runs to log in if you're doing something like Zoom for your event. Um, but building those FAQs ahead of time are really going to help um, help you and your attendees. Um, virtual attendees, virtual events can increase your attendees count and reach. So maybe pre-pandemic, your local bingo, bingo hall could only hold 200 attendees. Um, but if you play bingo online, not only does that open the attendee count to be a sky's the limit, um, but people are also no longer bound by location and distance. Your one donor from across the country can now participate in bingo. And you can also have donors that were probably um, uh, unable to drive or unable to usually make it to an event um, attend because it's all online. Uh, the next slide, please. So here are just some event ideas. This is put together from both Barks and Casey Pet Project of just some different things that we have had tremendous success um, this year doing. So virtual galas, walks, runs, and other traditional events have um, established platforms for those. So if you are looking for a virtual solution to something that's already lucrative and popular, um, there are paid software solutions for that. And that would be the time where I would Google, um, you know, what kind of software to look for. Um, but I would say first, check with your own donor database company. Um, to see what kind of special tools they might already have hiding within your platform. A lot of people are very surprised to find out that they have peer-to-peer -peer components in their platform that they've never used before. And if you're not familiar with peer-to-peer -peer or what's called P2P, write it down. It will change your life. and It'll give you um, a safety net for your event in the, you know, situation where it has to get canceled because of COVID or for any other reason. Um, you know, Peer-to-peer -peer allows your festival to still be successful even if it gets rained out. Um, so if you haven't started doing peer-to-peer -peer with your biggest events of the year, figure out how you can uh, add that in. Um, our next thing is don't be afraid to do something completely new based around an existing partnership. So did you always do a big cocktail soiree to raise money? Well, obviously we're not gathering right now and you can't do it that way, but don't scrap it. Um, look into how you can turn this event into a dinner and cocktails to go fundraiser and then include some printed materials with whatever, you know, speech or state of the shelter that you would have normally given at the event. And here's just some other fun little ideas to get everyone's everyone's brain stirring. So as I mentioned before, online auctions, you can use Facebook as a free platform and it is a great way to not only up your uh, social media, um, uh, oh my gosh, what word am I looking for? To um, up your social media um, presence, but also to get your event done for free. Um, as mentioned before, cocktails to go. Um, you know, another thing that we did at Barks here is we always have an annual virtual beer garden. And instead we made that a week long carry out beer garden with all of our local usual breweries. Um, and it was great because we kept the tradition going. Uh, we engaged our supporters in a fun and social way. And we were supporting those local restaurants and partners who usually are the ones helping us because uh, they could certainly use some actual additional foot traffic this year. So we got to keep those partnerships and, and show them just how important they are to us. Um, some other fun virtual stuff that's been successful, which if, if you want to reach out to me, I can give you all the details on how we did virtual family feud for free. Bingo for free and 50-50 raffle boards for free, all using Google Forms. Um, I'm running over. 
some hybrid virtual events that have done really well. Just a little example of one that we just did at Barks that was, it blew my mind what a great success it was, was a virtual pumpkin pie eating video contest. So all we did was we sold the pies. Everyone was able to go pick them up at the local bakery that made them. They brought them home. They fed their dogs the pie and we voted on it. They posted the video and we voted on it. And whichever one got the most ridiculous comments won. Um, but it was a tremendous success. It actually sold out three times. We had to keep buying, <laughs> we had to keep asking our bakery to please add more pies for us. And, and people just really loved it, right? Because that is what events are this year? It's a way to keep your supporters engaged, to make them smile and make them, um, yeah, just really, uh, just really enjoy 2020 with you and help you raise money for your shelter. Bailey, thank you so much. I think we can go to the next slide, Sarah, uh, and to this amazing team. Uh, I'm so excited. We still have a few extra minutes left for questions to answer, but uh, just wanted to give a quick shout out to just the orgs that are presenting right now, but the folks that actually participated in helping put this presentation together uh, are many more organizations. So in the chat, uh, I'm currently putting a link to the entire working group and all of the members that have really been helping us lift this project forward. Um, another thing that we wanted to do is make sure that you have a way to get in contact with us, but also connect with other peers in the industry. Uh, we've learned through COVID that we are stronger together. And as the Haas model and many other sort of statewide and national movements have moved forward, uh, there's more collaboration than ever. So the Haas project and the fundraising working group have actually put together a resource directory. So the link that I just shared in the chat is the way that you're going to find all of our information. Uh, and we have actually set it up so that you can actually tag the areas that you feel that you might be an expert or can support other peers. So one, not only are we asking you to reach out to us if you need help, but two, if you feel like that you can be a resource for someone in your region or around the country, please add yourself to that directory and let's create a network of life-saving based off of the philanthropy perk that we do. Um, so since we do have a couple more minutes for questions, there's something I wanted to dive into that Ashley D had already answered. It's a, such a great question about direct mail and some people telling organizations not to mail them anything more because they're focused on the environment. Uh, through the Haas project, uh, the One Health model, which incorporates people, pets, and the environment is something that we do take very seriously. But Ashley, you had a great response to that and sort of the benefit of continuing to do direct mail. I'd love for you to answer that for the group. Sure. You know, I, I get it as well. I care about the environment. I want to make sure that, you know, trees are here to help us breathe and do good work. I completely understand. I think it's a donor's preference. And I think anybody who is a fundraiser really understands that donors have their own preferences about how they like to be communicated with and how they don't. Um, you may hear from people that they don't want to have direct mail sent to them. That's great. Not a problem. Make sure that you can reflect that in your own database, as well as think about how you're connecting with those people and segmenting them to so that they get the same messages that you're sending out through direct mail. But honestly, every time I get somebody who says, I don't want to be in direct mail, I'm still getting three to five checks <laughs> to help fund our work um, from people who do need direct mail. So I think it's just important, each of us on the call today have really talked about different avenues and different mediums that people want to be communicated with and people want to engage with us, to use Brian's word. So it's keeping that in mind and making sure that all of these tactics are kind of brought in together in a really strong philanthropic strategy that allows you to connect with everybody who wants to support your organization and your mission. Yeah, thank you so much, Ashley. And I know it's also so critical to mention the fact that when we look at this project through a lens of diversity, equity, inclusion as well, and removing barriers, you know, we're not just talking about BIPOC communities. We're also talking about age, other disabilities, uh, access to technology. So sometimes, you know, getting that direct mail may be the only way that people can communicate with you. So always take that into consideration. Brian, something else when we're talking about how we move this industry forward, you know, you've touched on sort of how much of philanthropy animal welfare touches and what your goal is as far as moving that needle. Could you share a little bit of that with us? It definitely helps when I'm talking to unmute. So, you know, there you go. The first Zoom fail for today's call goes to me, the award winner. Hooray. Um, so I was just talking casually and then it told me I was muted. So anyway, um, 
Bobby, it's a great point. I think one of the things for everybody who's who's on this call in animal welfare, one of the things that many people in our communities think is that, oh, it's easy to raise money for dogs and cats, right? They Everybody gives to them. It's, it's simple. It's being funded essentially by other folks. And sure, it's true. People do love animals. But when you really look at philanthropy in this country, uh, essentially about 1% of the philanthropy that is generated, around 400, I can't remember the last stats on this, but $430 billion a year is given away philanthropically. And about 1% of that philanthropy comes to animal related causes. We are lumped in with animals and environment. That's 3% total. I believe through a bunch of other work that I've done that animals represent about 1% of the aggregate philanthropic um, giving in this country every year. Uh, it's my belief that animals at least at least deserve a minimum of 2%. And even in just pushing that to 2% would absolutely revolutionize and change animal welfare in this country. And the way that we can get there is by doing a number of the things that were talked about on this call, but it really is in about sort of breaking down a lot of barriers about what people think about animal related charities. I think the Haas movement does that and connecting it to um, people related services and it's beholden on all of us to be able to get out there and tell our stories um, really as aggressively and as appropriately as we can about what is our case for support, why does it matter, what are the impacts we're making, and to see what we can do to actually drive that change to have a larger portion uh, of the philanthropy in this country dedicated to animal related causes. Thank you, Brian. And I know we only have a couple minutes left. So I'm actually going to put the panelists on the spot and ask them a question that they did not know I was going to ask them. So if you have 30 seconds to explain what you hope the future, as Brian just did, of philanthropy in our industry would look like, what do you hope that would be? If you can change one thing or it would look a certain way, let's start with Bailey since she's already unmuted. Oh, on the hot seat. Um, you know, I think uh, for me, um, I, uh, well, the future of philanthropy, you know, I just love, um, my favorite, I'll, just, I'll start here. My favorite thing about um, philanthropy is incredible stories. Um, and that's my favorite thing. And what I'd like to see happen in the future or happen more often, whether it's direct mail or, um, you know, emails, social media posts is stories about the actual animals we serve. I think that for the animal welfare industry, we have a never ending incredible amount of stories that we can share. And I just, within our own you know, little sector of animal wel welfare, um, I would like to see more of that less, but instead just sharing those stories. I think across the board, I believe that that is the ticket for every single animal organization, whether huge or very small, um, to make a big splash and, and help their community understand what they're doing and help their community know why they should back them. Quick on your toes, Bailey, I love it. What a great answer. So it looks like we have time for one more response from our team. Does anybody want to step up and answer that question? Yeah, I'll jump in, Bobby. This is Ashley Drescher. You know, I really think into the, the mission of Haas and what we're here about, I really think that the future of the work that we're doing here in philanthropy in the animal services world is to understand that direct and connected impact between humans and people and animals. And if we can better understand that we're not just about adopting animals into loving families, but that animals bring strength to our community and that we are a better community if we have animals and humans working together, that we're going to win across the board and that people who have pets are healthier, they're less lonely, they are um, better members of our society. And if we can come together with every person who loves an animal, whether it be four-legged or chirping or any of the rest, if we can come together as a collective group to really strengthen our community through that connection of human and animals, I think we're gonna have a win on our hands. I love it. So tell our true stories, talk about keeping people and pets together and lead with love. So on behalf of the Human Animal Support Services Fundraising Philanthropy Working Group, uh, we want to thank you all for being here. Hope you learned a lot and uh, hope you have a wonderful holiday week.